Hello and welcome to the Mindful Men Podcast, a show inspiring men to be mindful about their lives. Each week, we'll dive into a range of topics that matter to men and hear from everyday people doing extraordinary things. So if you love the show, please give it a five-star rating and share it with your mates. Now, before we get into this week's episode, please note that some of the content may trigger you. And if this happens, please reach out to your support networks. It's really important. If you can't get enough of Mindful Men, head over to our website. It's www.mindful-men.com.au. Find the show notes and the links to our socials there. But for now, sit back, relax, and let's get mindful. G'day, guys, and welcome to another episode of the Mindful Men podcast. I'm your host, Simon Rinney, and today we're getting mindful about gambling addiction and how this impacts our mental health, career, and our reputation as well. And joining me for today's discussion, I've got Gary Fay from Brisbane, Queensland. How are you going, Gary? I'm um, well, thanks, Simon. Thanks very much for having me on and uh, also for the important work that you've uh, been doing with the Mindful Men. Oh, thanks so much. I really do appreciate it. And I was really excited to see your name pop up on my list of people to potentially interview. You've got quite the uh, story to tell and we'll go through that today. But to introduce you to anybody who isn't familiar with your work is you're a mental strength and performance specialist, which I'm keen to explore what that all is, and, and a speaker and an author. And you have this mantra, lived it, learned it, earned it which sounds amazing. So we're going to unpack that too. You've got over 18 years experience in the Australian Federal Police, and you also led the Prime Minister's personal protection team. And when I was reading this yesterday, I, I had this image of a a movie in my head. It sounds like such a movie <laughs> script, all these things that you've done and, and achieved and, and gone through, I guess, as well. Yeah, it's quite the CV. Yeah, I, I feel very blessed for all the lives that I've been able to live in my so far 46 years. Um you know, a lot of the good things. And I also feel blessed now for some of the uh, the bad things that I've been through. You know, they're, they're all part of the story. They're all part of how I arrived where I am. And while some of them uh, at the time I wish I didn't have to go through or put other people through, certainly been very blessed in everything that I've been able to uh, achieve and accomplish and, uh, and live through in this short space of time. Yeah, absolutely. It's often the things that we go through, the pain and the hurt, you know, those kind of events that when we come out the other side, we we rise like that phoenix and we have a lot of passion and purpose for what we do now. And so we'll explore all of that today. But I'd like to start off earlier and, and find out a bit more about you. Like, are you from Brazil or you're from somewhere else? Talk us through those early years. And I guess what led you to a career in the AFP as well? Yeah, I um, I grew up in Sydney. I grew up in, in Western Sydney, our Penrith Way, Mount Druitt Way, for people that know that area. It's a low socioeconomic area, hardworking parents. Fortunate enough, my parents are still with us and and still together. It was a, a great family. It is a great family. I'm a I'm an only child, and I experienced things that, as far as I'm concerned, were normal upbringings in Australia. I played sports, hung out with friends, enjoyed school, got involved with a whole lot of uh, activities around the place. Grew up in a time before the internet. Yeah, I I, I think it was as normal an upbringing as I could imagine, a, a very loving one. And through high school, I toyed around with a whole number of ideas for jobs. I wanted to be a pilot, a physio, a police officer, a, you know, a cowboy probably at some stage. And mid-high school, I stumbled across the Australian Federal Police. I was very interested in it because I was interested in solving problems. I probably wasn't as interested in being a uniformed police officer. I wanted to do detective-style work, and, and, and the AFP was something that, that drew me to that. And you know, I was, I was very lucky. I, I didn't start down that path originally because they weren't taking any applicants uh, for about a five-year period, I think. So I became a PE teacher. And one day, mum rang and said, uh, do you see they're advertised for AFP? And eight months later, I was on my first course. You reminded me, just as you, you're reeling off what you wanted to do, so physio, PE teacher, these are some of the things that I think most guys that I knew, and particularly my, myself included, were thinking about doing as well. But why PE teaching, I guess? Like, yeah, what was the draw there? And then were you disappointed to let that go and join the AFP, or was your AFP your, your true purpose and passion? I enjoyed PE as a subject, but I was, um, I was quite sporty, so I thought it made a lot of sense. But I also was very interested in the health side of things as well, the personal development side, the theory behind exercise, uh, the theory behind health and well-being. So it was a natural fit for me to go into something in that space. 
truth be told, the main reason I went to university or started to explore another option was I understood that getting into the federal police, having a university degree was one of the criteria or one of three or four different criteria that you could have to go in. So I also I, I thought, well, it made sense for me to do a uni degree in something I liked. So PE teaching happened to be it. I remember vividly having a, a thought process when I joined the AFP, and that was I knew I could always go back to teaching. I loved it. In fact, I did it for six years casually, even when I was in the police. I used to go back in my holidays. So I, I loved teaching, but I did have a conscious conversation with myself that if I didn't follow the AFP path, I could potentially get to 30 and regret it. Whereas if I didn't like the AFP path, I always had teaching to go back to. So it was a no-brainer to me. Yeah. And so talk us through those early days. You know, you've applied for the AFP, you got in. Talk us through like what that experience was like and some of the things that you did during the, your AFP career. Yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting process. Uh, it was a handwritten process, uh, strangely enough. It was uh, it, it was 19, 98, November 98 when I filled out the application, but it's still a handwritten process. And yeah, I had to go through a bunch of testing, you know, three hours of psych testing and maths questions and English and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, it was, that was an interesting process in and of itself over about a six-month period. Joined in, in June, end of June 99 and a few months in Canberra, not the best place to start your career in the middle of winter, but a uh, few months in Canberra on course. And then I came back to Sydney and I got very lucky, I suppose. I always put myself in positions to say yes. And um, within a couple of months, I was out on a boat, on a customs boat for five days chasing uh, cocaine shipment, which ended up being the largest cocaine shipment Australia had seen at that stage, 520 kilos. And, you know, so here's me four months out of college, you know, uh, involved very loosely and limited involvement, but involved in a job like that. And uh, I really opened my eyes up to the enjoyment, the excitement and the benefit of the role. Shortly after that, I uh, I went into surveillance. So I did a couple of years doing surveillance, covert surveillance for, for around um, international and organised crime syndicates, drug importations largely. Again, very exciting, very enjoyable, very rewarding. Team environment, something that I'd been used to quite a bit. And uh, during that time, September 11 happened and there was a big drive for close protection officers. We started looking after a lot more people and going into close protection was something that I always wanted to do, but because it was a difficult area to get in, I was told it'd be about 10 years until I could get into that. And, you know, unfortunately, September 11 happened, but it did open up a lot of opportunity. And so in 2002, I started in close protection and managed to see a lot of the world. I went to Indonesia six days after our embassy was bombed. I did a full tour of the Gallipoli Peninsula, a lot of stuff that uh, had been very exciting. And 2007 election, they asked, would I be interested in joining the opposition leaders team, Kevin Rudd? And when he won office, I was fortunate enough to stay as the team leader in, uh, in that role. And that was a fantastic, turbulent and hectic and enjoyable period. And then my last job, I ended up in the commissioner's office. I was running the commissioner's office for, uh, for a couple of years as an advisor there, as the uh, executive officer. A lot of strategy, a lot of organisational uh, culture and that sort of stuff. And it was a long career, probably not a lot of policing in my policing career, but very enjoyable, very rewarding. You paint this picture of a, a bit of a jet-setting career, you know, all over the place doing lots of, you know, exciting things, but often, you know, obviously not as, as exciting sometimes as well. Like how did that impact your relationships back home, like with your family? Like do you have a partner, kids or your mates as well? How did that all impact having this career where you're going all over the world and I, I assume not spending much time at home? Yeah, look, unfortunately it did take a toll and and probably like a lot of, a lot of men but a lot of people in high-performance fields and high-pressure fields, I had blinkers on a lot. I was on autopilot. I was career chasing. Um, I wasn't necessarily chasing promotion, but I was chasing the jobs and the opportunities and the identity that I wanted to fulfill inside the AFP. And that came at a cost. I had two divorces in the police, uh, another significant relationship breakdown as well. And most of that was due to my inability to be the man that I should have been at home. Looking back, I think it's entirely possible that you can be both. It's just that I wasn't very conscious about building the man outside of the AFP. I was more focused on, uh, you know, climbing the ladder, so to speak, or following the path that I'd chosen in my performance field. 
doesn't matter whether it's business, athletics, the police. That was my focus. That was my, I'll say it was my sole focus. And unfortunately, things unraveled around the outside of that, that I wasn't, I wasn't really aware or conscious of. Certainly, I wasn't aware of my own involvement in that process. So certainly came at a toll. Again, I, I wish I didn't have to suffer some of those things. I wish I didn't have to put other people through some of those things. But I, I can't be too critical of it because I also had some fantastic experiences that led me to where I am today. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned before, like you didn't really have this connection with or you weren't sure who the man outside of the AFP was. So can you paint us a picture of who the man inside the AFP was compared to that man outside as well? Yeah, the probably the simplest way to put the man outside of the AFP and maybe even to a point the same man inside was I was what I would now consider a victim of circumstance, a victim of conditioning and a victim of comfort. I never bothered to actually sit down and ask myself, what type of man do I want to be? And so I just kept following the natural path, the path that I'd seen others lead. Instagram wasn't around then, but these days it'd be the path that you see someone talking about on Instagram. The person I thought I was supposed to be, the person I thought everybody else wanted me to be. And so I just kept going along that path. There was a little more consciousness to it in the AFP, Probably if I boiled it all down to my identity inside there was I always wanted to be a guy that people would call when they needed something. I didn't care about what rank I had, but I did want to be a guy that you called when there was no one else to call. And so I I, I might have jumped around a couple of jobs, but it was primarily based around being invited to jobs and putting myself in a in a picture to move into those areas. So certainly outside the AFP, my lifestyle was more unconscious, things that I thought I should be doing and buying and living and going out and all of those uh, those you know fun things and good stuff. And it's not too bad when you're 18, 19 and 20. But when you're trying to combine that with a growing career and high performance and high pressure, eventually something falls away and took me a long time to realize what was falling away and whose fault it was. Yeah. You talk about high performance and high pressure as well. And I, and I think towards that time, providing professional or personal protection for Prime Minister Rudd, at, you know, and the opposition when he was in opposition as well. What was that like, you know, walking around with the Prime Minister of Australia and protecting him, obviously keeping your eyes and ears peeled as well? Like how much pressure was there for that kind of role? There's definitely pressure there. I think the it's a lot more subconscious, especially for me at the time. I mean, I remember having conversations with people and, you know, reflecting back, I, I'm really proud of the work that I was able to do and I'm actually excited by it now. But I, I, I try and talk to my son. I don't, I don't have any photos of that period of time because to me it was just my job. So even though, uh, you know, there is an inherent high pressure to it, there's a responsibility to it, at the time, consciously I just thought, well, this is my job. This is what I do. But I do think under the surface a little bit, you know, your body is working at different at different levels. Your mind is working at different levels. You know, I've described it as problem solving on steroids, you know, running the prime minister's team, even running the commissioner's office. And that's what I still probably believe. That's what I was born to do was solve problems on grand scales. And, you know, so I love that part of it. But that also made it very easy for me to close down the rest of my life and the rest of my world that, I love this so much. This is what I was built to do. Everything else can just, you know, can just wait. And uh, eventually it couldn't wait any longer. And I guess as as an outsider looking in and and hearing about the AFP and these types of roles that you're doing, one of the, the words that come to mind or the phrases come to mind is alpha male. And I'm interested to hear about your your thoughts on the culture in terms of masculinity in those kind of environments and the need for masculinity and strength and, and perseverance. But also, was there any room for the processing trauma that you might have been part of or or anything like that? Yeah. Can you talk us through that cultural aspect of, of working in these roles? Yeah. I, I think it's very important to, as you put it, identify the purpose of masculinity or alpha type personalities in in some of these roles. As I've gotten a bit older, I've learned a lot more the value of compartmentalizing elements of my life and doing so with more self-awareness. So in the past, compartmentalizing used to be, if I don't want to talk about it, I, I shut it down and I never talk about it. To me, these days, there are times in my life where I need to be the man and stand up for my, you know, my wife and my family and, and 
you know, if you're in a career, then I have to be that. But there's also times in my life where I'm allowed to and should be vulnerable or ask questions or emotional. And so I, I do feel like uh, the perfect balance is to compartmentalize, but to also be aware of the right occasion for which type of personality can come out. But it's very difficult in high performance environments because, you know, subconsciously and conditioned throughout life is that if we show any vulnerability, it's a trigger of weakness. It opens up opportunity for others to perhaps take our place or for somebody else to, you know, dominate us in a in an environment. And, you know, if you're in an environment where you're doing close protection and a situation happens, there's no two ways about it. You want to be the most dominant force in that environment. Right? And so some of these lines can get blurred where you train yourself so much to be dominant. There's not a lot of mental strength work, uh, my, in my terms, to work with people on allowing them the opportunity to also understand when they can be vulnerable or when they need to let down. Debriefing's probably, look, I haven't been in the police for six years now, so five years now, so I, I can't comment to now. From what I understand, not a lot has changed. I know they're moving if they can, but there's also not a lot of conscious debriefing done. There's a lot of liquid debriefing was the term used in the, in the old days. I didn't drink a lot, but you know, after big events, people would go out drinking and that's how they deal with some of their issues. Can be beneficial in small ways sometimes, but I don't think there is a lot of demonstrated masculine traits that also identify these are the times and the ways that you can be vulnerable. There's a concept called social inertia that that indicates that it's not until the critical mass actually wants something to happen that it happens. And I think in a lot of alpha-dominated environments, the critical mass is still conditioned that to be silent, to be strong, to be stoic. And even though the policies and the intention and everybody's conscious thought process is that it should be okay to speak up, we're not quite yet where the there's enough critical mass to have swung that. So I still think there's, you know, there's probably five or 10 years, maybe a generation where we have to go through tough people speaking up and actually being leaders in that space so we can get that critical mass to, to move. Yeah. You've got this mantra, lived it, learned it, earned it. And I'd love to hear about where this came from. Is this, you know, some of this subconscious stuff coming to the conscious level or talk us through where this mantra come from and why is it important for you to live by this? Yeah, look, it really came from, you know, throughout my experiences. But when I was battling my mental health dramas, you know, over, over a 10-year period, I found it very difficult, first of all, to acknowledge to myself that I was struggling. That was a, that was my first difficulty. Secondly, was to speak up about it. And thirdly, was to find voices that resonated with me. So even if I was to see a counsellor, a therapist, a psychologist, the voices didn't really resonate with me. You know, an alpha male, high performance male. You know, I'm talking to somebody who's read it in a book. I don't really know if they've done it. You know, have they experienced what I've experienced? Uh, all of those sorts of things. Now. That's not to denigrate the work that they do or the value of them, because I've had a lot of value out of psychologists, psychiatrists, and counselors. But at the time, it didn't seem like these people could understand my feelings. You know, not that they had to have been in the police, but I didn't even know if they'd ever struggled with anything and it didn't appear that way to me. So when I started down this path, originally I started, you know, working with men specifically on um, on some of their mental health issues. It was very important to me that. Um, that they understood that I have lived it and lived it on both sides. I've lived it from being the alpha male, from being the high performer in the high pressure world. So I, I understand what that feels like. I understand also what the the road to rock bottom feels like. So I've lived that part of it. And then I've also lived the path out as well. And so I understand, you know, certainly from my own experience, the journey from being up, being down and building your way back out. The learned it part, I mean, the only way that I got out was to learn. It was to start to understand how the mind works, the neuroscience, the psychology, habits. So I did a lot of informal training to help myself and, and then gone back and done some formal training. I've now got a master's in brain and mind sciences and I'm working on some counseling stuff as well. And so that became, you know, it's now learned. I haven't just lived the experience. I've actually got some academic and theory fundamentals behind it. And to be honest, the earn part, it's just hard work. 
you know, I, I was at rock bottom. I was at that moment in time where you start to consider the value of your own life. And to get from there to where I am now in a five-year period, that's earned. You know, there's nothing but your own work going into that 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 gets you there. And so it really resonated with me that you know, I've had these experiences, I've learned all this stuff, but if I didn't do it, I still wouldn't be where I am. And, and that's where the, the trilogy of those things come together. I love this. It highlights the the importance, I believe, in lived experience in, in this kind of area, particularly for guys. And, and I focus in my therapy business on guys specifically for having lived with undiagnosed mental illness for over 20 years, and then I still live with it today. And I, I don't hide away from that, but it helps the guys when they come into my therapies to, to say, do you know what it's like to feel like shit? And I'm like, well, yeah, I do, actually. But this is not about me, but I can give you some of my tips or tools or things that I've learned along my journey. And that's been both you know, academic, but also in my own therapy as well. So I often bring tools that my therapists give me as well and share with my guys. And it is an earning thing. You've got to do the hard work. You've got to be there, know what it feels like as well. And, and when you, I love how you piece it all together and, and, and you come out the other side because of, you know, it's so important that we see that there is hope at the end of the tunnel. There is light there. And we often get stuck and we feel like we can't go forward anymore or it's too dark or, or it's too heavy. We can't process the stuff. We can't talk about it for many guys. But there is hope. You can live it. You can learn it. And you can earn it. And I love this about it. And so you talk about your rock bottom moment. And I think it's important to to highlight what, you know, as much as you're comfortable about sharing, what did rock bottom look like for you? And I guess how did that impact your career and your reputation as well? Because I think from what I've seen of, of your work, it has been a very public thing as well. So I'd love to hear a bit about this as well, as much as you're comfortable to share. Yeah, look, I'm happy to share all of it. You know, at the start, some of that story got taken out of my hands and it was shared through the media. But I've learned to as accept that now. And also the fact that, you know, again, that's been a benefit to me personally, you know, because it helped me deal with a few things that I needed to, to deal with. But the strange thing for me was at the the height of my career, everybody outside would have been looking at me saying, this guy has it all together. You know, he's, he's, on, he's on a good career path. He's getting you know, good money. He's got good friends. He's got a good lifestyle. Everything that you would expect a successful person to have. That's, that's what I had in my career. I, I was at the top of my career and I was the most broken I'd ever been inside. And, and the, my 10, I had a 10-year battle with depression. That all happened in the last 10 years of my career. So the, the best parts of my career was the worst parts of my internal life. And I also had a gambling addiction. That's where I went to escape. As I said before, I wasn't a big drinker. I, I never take drugs, but I, I did gamble as a younger person. And that seemed to be a place where the noise would switch off for me. You know, all the noise in my head, the not being able to sleep, all of that sort of stuff. If I was gambling, I could shut it off. And unfortunately, over a 10-year period, that noise got louder and louder and required more attention to turn it off. And, you know, that gambling addiction, ultimately, it cost me $2 million in straight gambling money, but it also cost my career, uh, my reputation, and also had me on that, you know, that verge of considering the value of my own life. And, um, you know, I made some very silly mistakes with my work credit card, used it for the wrong reasons because of some of the stupid decisions that I was making in my life and the inability for me to confront and work through those at an early enough stage. So I lost my job. Well, I, I resigned from the job, but ultimately my job was untenable. So I lost my job. I also had to face some criminal charges for misusing the credit card. Unfortunately, none of these were my rock bottom moment, to be honest. I thought they were, and I shifted a little bit. I'd changed stuff around and I'd made some progress. And then like a lot of people, I drifted back because unfortunately I was focused on the wrong problem. You know, I was, I was focused on the gambling problem, which I say is the, the problem I saw in the mirror, but I, I'd never focused on the, the deeper issues before. And so I went another 12 months or I went six months without gambling and then started again. And, and then my name got leaked to the paper and my story got leaked to the paper. And then I identified where I was living and we just moved areas. And I just felt like everything was hopeless. I just felt like at that time, I've tried and failed to quit gambling a number of times over 10 years. I'm a pretty industrious guy. I figured that I'd probably tried everything I could have and it still wasn't successful. And all I was doing now was ruining everybody's life around me. 
And whilst I understood the damage it would do if I wasn't here, I also believe that, well, if I can't fix this problem, I'm only hurting everybody else, so I might as well not be. And that was my rock bottom. That was the scary moment in my life. Getting to that point of researching and, and going further down that track, it genuinely scared me. And thankfully, I was sensible enough to go to the doctor. I, I went, just went to the doctor. Doctor, I didn't know. I First one I could get into, told him what was going on, and I made a promise to myself that I would do anything the doctor told me. That was the only thing that I could do. I, I had no no ability to solve that problem at that time on my own. And the doctor sent me to a psychiatrist. I worked with the psychiatrist for a little while, worked with a psychologist, went back to gambling help, found some immediate relief just from having shared the problem, I suppose. And then over a nine-month period, really worked hard at, at a lot of the fundamentals and had what I would call my come to Jesus moment, you know, nine months after that point in time. And life has been completely different, you know, again, for the last five years. In five days' time, it'll be five years. Wow. Can I ask what kind of gambling it is? Because as we're recording this week episode that it's released on the Michael Min podcast is one with Kate Seselger, and she talks around the lure of pokies, and she had a, a long pokies addiction as well. What kind of addiction did you have? And I guess when you went into the GP's office as well, was that the first time you even opened up about this type of stuff, or had you done a bit of this work before as well? Yeah, so my, my gambling of choice was horses or horses, trots, and greyhounds. I had played pokies a little bit earlier in my time and they were, they were fine. And every now and then, if I did get stuck there, I could lose a bit of money, but I wasn't drawn to go and play poker machines. Primarily, probably because of the ease of gambling on my phone. I could do it at home, could do it more silently, I suppose. I didn't have to leave home. You know, I, I'm not one to make noise about the fact that you can gamble on your phone. Personally, think that it's fine. It's just that I wasn't able to control it and I wasn't able to control myself or look after myself. And But it was easy for me to do it that way. But I also enjoyed it. I enjoyed horse racing, watching it and being involved with it. That sort of stuff. I still watch and, and, and listen and, and involve in some ways uh, these days. So, But the, the gambling is not an issue for me today. But I had sought help for it before. So we're talking about a period... I, went, I first sought help, I think it was the end of 2007, went to see a psychologist about gambling, uh, free gambling help psychologist. I went twice and I stopped going. And I stopped going because every time I went, they were telling me things that I already knew. And again, later on in hindsight, I realized that what was happening was I was going to the psychologist in a rational thinking mind, right? I, I knew all the things that I shouldn't be doing. And they were telling me all the same thing. And I figured, well, there's no point in me coming here because they're not really helping. Problem that I've since learned is that I needed help when my mind was in irrational thinking. And I needed to build skills, like JFK said, I needed to fix the roof when the sun was shining. I needed to build skills when I was in rational thinking so that when I was irrational, I might have had a chance to actually do the right thing. So in 2007, I first sought help for it. I stopped gambling for a while after that, six months-ish, started gambling again, became a problem another year or two later. Didn't see any help then, but but went through a similar path personally and stopped gambling again. So focused on doing things to stop gambling. Probably around 2015, I went again. Yeah, actually, I did. 2015 it was. Uh, I went again. And this was where my issues at work started to be apparent. So I went to see gambling help for a little while. I also tried to see a counsellor through work. And again, that became one of those doesn't resonate with me. And I really wasn't getting anything out of it. And then I got a call into the deputy commissioner's office to start talking about my misuse of credit card. So I had started down a path of trying to seek help, more permanently help, I suppose, for it. But I knew it was a, an issue. But again, I'd always thought I had a gambling issue and tried to fix a gambling issue and didn't really realize that initially the depression was underpinning that. But then also underpinning the depression was you know, an issue with my own ego, uh, ego in the sense of the I, the, the, you know, not in terms of chest beating ego, but I, I didn't know who I was or where I was going, certainly not consciously. And because of that confusion, I ended up depressed because of that depression I needed to escape and ended up uh, where I was. Yeah, wow. 
I often think about gambling in Australia, like since I've become more, I think more of a, as a parent as well. So I've got little ones. Mine, my oldest is six, uh, my boy, and I'm starting to get him into watching footy, which is amazing. I love wire footy and sitting down and doing that. But And when I was younger, this didn't really bother me so much. You'd see all the, the betting ads on the TV and it could be for the horses or it could be for the footy or it could be for whatever. And it's the old ex-players. It's very jovial. It's very fun. And my son's like, Dad, what is all this? Like, what does betting mean and gambling? And, I, and I'm like, I wish they didn't have it on the TV now that I'm a dad because I just we just want to watch the footy. But every two minutes, there's like a little betting thing that comes on. You mentioned before that you don't necessarily mind that you can get it on your phone. What about the ads and so, and so forth and how they in, impact us in terms of keeping us or attracting us in it in the first place, but also keeping us, you know, I guess in some sort of addiction grip as well? Yeah, look, I, I think in a perfect world they wouldn't exist. But, I mean, in a perfect world, neither would ads for you know, fast food, neither would ads for junk food, neither would ads for you know, alcohol and all that sort of stuff. But I also don't know that that would be a perfect world because if we're so shielded and shaded from things that are out there and then all of a sudden, you know, you, you're, you're now able to have conversations with your kids at six years old that may never come up until they're 18 and now they're making their own choices and they haven't had any experience in discussing them. Now, I, I think there's something like close to 400 gambling ads on free-to-air TV a day. Maybe they don't need to be on every ad and maybe, you know, they need to be on different times and I think one of the main reasons I'm not necessarily against apps or ads or or pokies in in and of themselves or horse racing in and of themselves is because I focus a lot more on the individual and I think that if we can create and this is again this is the same with food this isn't a gambling thing this is the same with alcohol it's the same with cigarettes if we can build more individuals that are capable of managing their own lives, their own mental health, their own mental strength, their own decisions and behaviours, then these other things aren't a problem. And I do think the world does need some release, you know, and that's different for everybody. It's art for some people, it's surfing for others. So, yeah, I'm not against it conceptually, but I am more about trying to build and develop the individual. And look, I'll be honest, I think if more, if we were able to build resilience into more individuals, you probably find the gambling and poker machines would drop anyway because the only reason they exist is because people are using them and putting money into them. And, and if people stop doing that, you know, which is within your control. And again, to me, that's the only thing that I worry about. What can I control? I can't control whether they put ads on the TV. I can jump up and down and, and look, and it's very valuable to people that do that. That's not the best use of my time. The best use of my time is to work on me to make sure that the ads are there, but the same as ad for, you know, I don't know, chips. I, I don't run out and get chips, you know, because that's that's not what I do. So, yeah, that, that's probably my stance on it. But I also appreciate the damage when people aren't like I was, not conscious about themselves and what to do. The damage can be drastic and that's some, sometimes irreparable. Yeah, absolutely. It's almost like when it becomes a problem, what are you really hiding from? What's underneath, you know, the, is it the gambling or the food addiction or the drinking or whatever it is, what's underneath, what's causing you to, to escape or try to escape? And as you mentioned before, the longer it goes, the more profound it needs to be to get that kind of release as well. So you could be starting off with one beer, for example, if you're a drinker, ends up being a carton and, and then more and more and more and more. Let's pivot now to how you've you've come out and and the what the work you're doing today to try a advocate for it. And I'm interested to see if now that you're advocating for positive mental health and talking about things, are any of your ex colleagues coming forth and saying, "Hey, yeah, I, I, I struggled too," or is that creating a bit of a wave there? And and what some of the work you're doing today to I guess inspire and help other guys go through similar challenges. Yeah, I, I certainly haven't heard from anybody from my old work. Most, uh, I, I think, forgot I existed the moment I got in trouble. Maybe not forgot I existed, but certainly found it difficult to, to engage with me. A few stuck around for a while, but I wasn't really the man that I wanted to be. You know, I wasn't showing up as a friend that I should have been in those circumstances. So, you know, eventually a lot of those fell by the wayside and none have reached back out. So as far as I know, but none have reached back out. So, oh, which is fine. You know, I, I live now in a different way than I used to live before. But I've been very fortunate enough that I'm an ambassador for the Australian New Zealand Mental Health Association. So I do get a bit of a platform to use my story, to share experiences, use what I've learned, use what I've worked through. And so I you know, 
fortunate enough to have spoken at the Australian New Zealand Addiction Conference a few times, uh, the International Mental Health Conference through the, the Mental Health Association as well. And I get a lot of positive feedback. In fact, almost everywhere I go, even when I play golf and I tell people what I do or I tell people my story, it's amazing how many people will tell me, oh, you need a, I've got a friend who needs to talk to you or actually I probably could do with a bit of help there or this is something that I've confronted in, in my life. It's unfortunately, uh, I feel like I could work 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of my life and clone me a hundred times and there would still be far more work needed to be done. Unfortunately, I deal also with a group of people who are unwilling often to recognise themselves that they've got an issue. And so part of what I try and do, and, and again, grateful for podcasts such as yourself, is to create more voices that resonate with these men so that they might actually start to see, oh, hang on, somebody else has been there. And, you know, you mentioned hope before in probably an alpha male high performance speak, I'd like to say it's confidence. And, and we get confidence from either having done something ourselves and in the absence of that, seeing that somebody else has been able to do it. And so in telling some of the stories, I, I hope that that some people will get the confidence that, oh, actually, I feel like that and there is a way out, whether or not they want to do that with me or somebody else or themselves. Fantastic. But at least the, the awareness is there. and. You know, so over the last five years, three specifically, I started off working with men only, basically because that was my experience. I'm a man. I, I know what it feels like. That started to then include some probably alpha personality women or more high-performing women. And then as it's evolved, it's it's become a lot more, again, my own journey, high-performance, high-pressure individuals that are, are looking to overcome some obstacles in their personal or professional life. You know, a lot of the times they cross over, you know, we're struggling at work and it affects home. I'm struggling at home and it affects work. And then the follow on from that is I'm fortunate enough that a few of those we now also work on improving performance. So once we've overcome the obstacles, we get to improve individual performance, team performance, business performance. You know, that's been a journey in and of itself for me, but I try and be the coach that I needed 10, 15 years ago. And I, I try and work very hard on being that person and working with people that resonate with me as well, not just I resonate with them, but, you know, that's a world that I know. High performance is a world that I know. I'm now fortunate enough that I've been back to uni to put some theoretical knowledge behind it as well, and we seem to get pretty good results. Yeah, what's some of the, I guess, the frameworks that you draw from? So, for example, this is the Mindful Men podcast. So I do a lot of mindfulness-based therapy approaches in my, you know, work with one, one-to-one -one with guys. Do you draw from anything particular or, and you mentioned a bit about the ego and the eye and trying to find, I guess, that inner purpose as well. Like how do you draw that out in some of the clients that you work with? Yeah, look, I, I use a, a bunch of tools, I suppose, mindfulness, meditation, those types of things, breath, breath work as tools. Very custom, I suppose, depending on the individual and what their acceptance levels are. Sometimes we've got to ease men into meditation and, and mindfulness and me included, I, I wasn't there at the start of this journey. And it was only when I promised that I'd do anything the psychologist and the doctor said that I tried it. But, you know, it probably draws a little bit on uh, acceptance, commitment therapy principles, some on cognitive behavior principles, positive psychology type of stuff. But ultimately, I build it a lot into a framework that I've looked around the world and, and most success, whether you're at rock bottom or on the edge of greatness, most of that success comes by really three broad Parts, and that is creating a clear, conscious, and compelling identity and vision of the future, renovating your internal alignment and your current thought process, and then you know creating a strategy. And I like to say, a proven, you know, following a proven strategy that builds a process that you just practice every single day. Everything I do fits within those three categories because every success in some way fits into those three categories. And then the tools I use will will depend on the individual, what their needs are, where they are in their life and, and those sorts of things. But it's a process that if you really think about any, you know, the success of your podcast, I dare say at some stage you became conscious about the vision that you wanted to have. You had to get over your limiting beliefs and putting yourself on camera. And then you had to do a process that you, you know, you just practice every time you, you do it. That's what I do. That's what we all do. I just uh, am able to help 
facilitate that in men with questions that they may not be able to ask themselves. Yeah. You've mentioned a few times, it is very difficult to get guys into a therapy process or a coaching process as well. And I'm often actually called by the partner or the or the friend or something like saying, hey, you need to talk to this person. And some of the blokes that I, I work with, they really do struggle to talk in a session. And so I love to take therapy out of a clinic and I do have a clinic space, but I've I can be often seen driving around with a bloke or on the beach with a bloke at a cafe doing, you know, even just walking a dog or something like that, doing things a little bit differently, but you're still using those same therapeutic tools. Can you paint a picture of of that kind of guy who would really struggle to come in and start talking? Like how would a session look if they were to work with you? So I've been doing this for three years. I've had a, I'll call it a hybrid office for three years. I've never been in (laughs) I don't do sessions there. I do a lot by Zoom now because I've got clients overseas, interstate, some in Brisbane that don't uh, that prefer Zoom, so that's fine. I do do it by Zoom. I do coffee. I do steak, a uh, game of golf, a walk, any of the above. If you don't have a drinking problem, we'll go to the pub. And look, again, because I have a lived experience of this, I have a conversation with people. I, I don't do therapy, you know, if you want to put the clinical word on it. You know, that, I don't run a therapy model. I tell people I'm not interested in your past. I'm interested in where you're going. We do deal with it if there's an issue that we need to deal with. But I do find also that that hampers a lot of men that they don't want to delve into that past. And I don't need to. I certainly don't need to on day one. And I don't need to to get you moving forward. And at some stage, if you feel comfortable enough, we can deal with that. I'll say that probably in 70, 80% of occasions, as long as you get moving forward, the issues of the past tend to at least diminish they might not completely go away but they certainly don't have as big of a a say in in how you're feeling so yeah i I don't do sessions in in offices typically yeah over lunch over coffee depending on who it is and where yeah nine holes of golf if i live close to the beach probably the beach yeah i think i'm going to add golf to my repertoire (laughs) i've done the basketball court i've done video games i've done drives but yeah not golf yet i work outs i I, I do a personal trainer as well so yeah workouts often i used to do a lot of personal training session with a coffee afterwards and and it's it's a conversation and it's two two blokes sharing their experiences not one bloke telling another guy you know i just read an article or a, a review or a report for out of british columbia and the university of melbourne and one of the issues that men tend to have is a power dynamic you know if i walk into a psychologist's office i'm the one with the problem they're the one with the solution and no problem and this is a power imbalance i have a conversation we we share experiences and hopefully some of my experiences, including my educational ones, are beneficial to you moving forward. And and then I like to say I almost become mates with everybody that, that I work with, you know. I, yeah. I now have people that are ex-clients that we go out and catch up, you know, because that's the people I work with. That highlights like the really the importance of that lived experience as well, because you can just make it real. And particularly for guys, they just like real chats. My sessions often have a lot of banter in them as well. It's that, you know, making fun of each other and and trying not to be bogged down in the heaviness of it, actually looking forward to the future because that brings the lightness back, you know, and the conscious living as well. So it sounds like we do a very similar approach to our work with guys. And and it's nice to know there's another practitioner out there doing that because I still see around the traps like a a lot of that traditional therapy or clinic stuff happening and a lot of guys don't resonate with that like i for a long time didn't resonate with that it's only since i found guys that i've really connected with that i'm okay to go in and go yep i'm happy to sit here and do this but i actually get a lot of value out of my own work with guys where i'm out and about getting that incidental exercise you know being part of a community we live in a beautiful part of the world where it's sunny most of the time as well and, and great weather so it's just nice to be out breaking down the the stigma associated with getting help in the first place. Yeah, and I don't know if you if you experience this yourself, but I've not had one session where I haven't learned more about myself anyway. Hmm. Look, there, there's certainly a value to a professional uh, service like a psychologist not sharing with you that they've had their own. Look, many psychologists have had their own lived experience, and there is a genuine reason why they don't share that with you. I get that, and I think that's very valuable. But I think there is a, a, a very necessary, in particular in the men's space and the high performance space, for professionals to be about sharing experiences, not instruction manuals. You know, this is what I've read and this is what it could be and this is what, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, men and high performance people are action takers, they're problem solvers, they're doers, and they like to do things together. 
it's like we're all in this together. They like to do team environments. They like it to be in service of something. But yeah, I don't think I've had a session ever that I haven't learned more about my own journey in that as well. So, you know, there's a little bit of selfishness in what I do. It's part of growing self as well as, as helping others. Absolutely. I've got one client who likes to start showing me tools that I don't know of as well. He's like, Simon, I've got a tool for you. So we, I write it down. I'm like, I'm going to capture that one as well. That's a great one. Yeah, absolutely. But Gary, I've really enjoyed this discussion around, and I think it, that lived it, learned it, earned it keeps coming back to me as we're talking as well. It's such a great, it's a powerful story. It is a lot of vulnerability in it. There's a lot of pain in it, but there's a lot of triumph as well. So a testament for you to coming out the other side and using that lived experience to help other guys as well and women as well. If someone's listening and they want to work with you, how do they best find you and and what's the process for, I guess, intake? Yeah, the, the best place to find me is Strong Mend, M-E-N-D, is my business. If they Google my name, they'll find me as well. I think all the bad stuff is now on page two or three of Google and the good stuff is on page one. But Gary Fay, they could Google me, Strong Mend or Strong Dot Mend on Instagram. And uh, if they go to my website, I always have a free coffee with people first. Yeah, it's a personal choice. I, I don't work with people that I don't resonate with that they don't resonate with me and I don't expect someone to pay for to figure that experience out. And, and I'm happy to share some experiences over that coffee. So yeah, if anybody anywhere around the world is interested, you just book in a time that suits you and you know, we have a coffee over Zoom or I meet you in my local area or your local area and yeah, you know, we take it from there. And, and if we, we want to work together, great. And if we don't, that's great too. And you know, hopefully you find a, a way to move forward. Wonderful. And we'll put all the links in the show notes so people can easily access them as well. But the last question, Gary, I like to ask all of my guests is to plug something that makes you feel good. So this is a pay it forward moment. It could be anything in the world. It doesn't have to be related to what we've talked about today. It's just something that's lighting your boat at the moment and maybe can pay it forward for so one of our listeners can tune into that as well and maybe check it out for themselves. Yeah, look, the, probably the latest thing that I've been enjoying is some breath work that I've just picked up or study I did for uni but out of andrew huberman's work out of stanford they they just released a study earlier this year a breathing methodology called cyclical sighing was shown to be the most beneficial breathing technique for reducing stress even more dare i say this on your podcast even more beneficial than meditation and more beneficial than wim hof which i've done before you know cyclical hyperventilation and box breathing so I've been experimenting a lot with that, and I have really found that to be of benefit to me. Physiological sighing, if you Google it, Andrew Huberman's got a five-minute YouTube that literally just does the breath work with you. You can just listen to him and do the breath work. Do that for a week, and I think people's lives will be uh, a lot less stressful. Yeah, I love it. There is a lot of power in breath work. I'm, I'm going back into breath work for after a period away and really enjoying that again. It's just such a an easy thing to do. And if you can find a, a great group to do it with, it's it's a great community builder, but also you can get a lot on, on YouTube as well, which I also do too. So thanks for sharing that with us, Gary. And, and thanks for sharing us your story and being vulnerable with us and, and getting mindful with us and helping guys out there to tune into what they're doing and maybe go, you know what, if Gary can talk about this, I can talk about this too. And I really do appreciate your time today. I appreciate it, Simon. And as I said up front, I really do value the um, yeah the podcast that you put together and the work that you're doing because, again, it's a space that a thousand people could get into and there'd still be more work required. And uh, so the more people doing this, focusing on, on men specifically, it's a much needed space, mate. So thank you very much. Hopefully I'll be up the Sunshine Coast one day and we can grab a coffee. Love to. And maybe a round of golf. I'm, not, I'm terrible at golf, but maybe a round. <laughs> That's all right. I'm very bad at it as well, but uh, it beats uh, everything else. Well, that's a wrap for today's episode and I hope you got some value from it. If anything triggered your mental health today, please reach out to your support networks. Also, if you love what you heard, be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your mates. For more from Mindful Men, you can check us out on Instagram and YouTube and I'll throw the links to these pages in the show notes below. But until next time, stay mindful.